about 2,000 years ago, there was a court official in Africa, and in today's terms, he was a CFO, Chief Financial Officer, for the Queen of Ethiopia. He was highly educated, and to understand what it cost for him to have the job of CFO, you need to understand that that culture at that time, perhaps the greatest held value was family, being able to have a family. The Instagram post of the day would have been filled with pictures of family and family vacations and children being born and children farming and your wealth was tied up into your family. To hold the position of CFO in an ancient queen's court, this man became a eunuch. Parts of his body had to be removed. He could never have a family. That was the cost of holding these kinds of positions in the ancient world. Part of it was to make sure he was trustworthy. Maybe it was to make sure he wouldn't quit for missing his family. And we don't know if he was forced into this or if he did it by choice, but he paid dearly for his job. And what we know that when his life ended on this earth, so did his family line. We also know this, that in Ethiopia at that time, that man would have had access to a great library, and it might explain that when he is reading a great book in Acts chapter 8, he is reading the scroll of Isaiah. In fact, in Acts chapter 8, we read about him in chapter 8, verse 27. It says, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, CFO. I didn't make this up. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And in verse 28, it says this, he was returning from Jerusalem, sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet. Now, I, I wanna say something here before I get to what he was reading. It actually tells us even more about this man that he was returning from Jerusalem. You know, to go from Ethiopia to Jerusalem, you didn't take a plane or a train. It was a long, dangerous, risky journey and the only way someone of his power and position and influence would risk taking away time from this job that he had paid dearly for was because he was seeking to satisfy a deep spiritual hunger. He had some questions about God, maybe about theology, about himself. He was longing, he was seeking. And more than likely, when he went to Jerusalem and perhaps went there to the temple, when he got there, he was turned away. He was a eunuch. The Old Testament says, no person who is maimed or deformed or in any way imperfect gets to go into the temple courts. After all the time and risk, he is turned away. Here you have a person, church, understand. Here you have a person who's cut off from family, Maybe he was rethinking, was it worth the cost I paid for the job? And now he risks his life and he's not even accepted by the religious system. And so you gotta ask the question, what was he reading? From Isaiah, that had so captured his mind and his heart and his will. And you know what, we know. Because in Acts chapter 8, it's these two verses from Isaiah 53 that he's reading. Isaiah 53, you heard it read already, verses 7 and 8. Let me show them to you again. Isaiah 53, verse 7 says, this is what the Ethiopian eunuch was reading. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before his shears, so he did not open his mouth. And then in verse 8, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered 
that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. Can you imagine how this must have lit up the soul of an Ethiopian eunuch who was turned away from the house of God because he could not have descendants? Can you imagine how this must have lit up the soul of an Ethiopian eunuch who was cut off from the possibility of all future family? How it might have touched his heart. Who had, was a person who had given everything for his job and it cost him dearly. In church today, this is part of why, you know, people ask me, Neil, how you feel about the world? And I say, I have incredible hope because of this Bible. Because I can imagine how this text today could light up the soul of somebody listening who maybe you have given a lot for your job and maybe it has caused you to be cut off from family. I can imagine how this text could speak uniquely to someone today who maybe in a world where we are told do whatever you want with your body, that maybe you did some things with your body at some point in your life and you carry regrets because you feel cut off from the person God has created you to be. I can imagine that in a world right now where <laughs> maybe you've just gotten swept along. Maybe even as a really young person, somehow you just got swept along with whatever our culture was saying. And maybe you actually made some choices with your body and now you are suffering irreversible damage. And I want you to know there is hope for you. That, that when you're away from all the social media and, and maybe your group that has said, you do this, it's all, it's so great, you're gonna feel free. But when you come home at night and you're alone and you sense, wow, I still have the angst in my soul. And, and you know, I can imagine today, y'all, I'm so happy to preach this passage that I've been meditating on for a year, almost every day. That for some of you who by no choice of yours, that it has been forced on you, that someone has done something to you and to your body. And somehow you feel cut off from the person God has created you to be. I really believe when you come to this, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 53 thinking something like this, my goodness, this person knows me. This person understands me. This person understands what life and what brokenness and what misplaced desires do to us, what sin has done for me. And here's how good God is. Here's how good he is to you today. God supernaturally arranges for this Apostle Philip to be in the right place at the right time to have a conversation with this Ethiopian eunuch about Jesus. Church is just another reason why we believe here conversations about Jesus are so important. <sighs> Philip and this man intersect on the road and the guy says to Philip, I gotta know, I gotta know. Who's the prophet talking about? And in Acts chapter eight, verse 35, I want you to see this. Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, what scripture? Isaiah 53, he told the Ethiopian eunuch the good news about Jesus. Would you turn with me this morning to Isaiah 53? Because we're gonna talk about the good news about Jesus. 
I want you to know Isaiah 53 is one of your most famous Old Testament passages, one of the most famous prophetic passages. And I want you to understand something on Isaiah 53. I tell you it's about Jesus today because of what Philip said. I want to be honest with the text and how difficult it is for some, how confusing it is for some. It's been a hotly debated passage over the years. And especially for Jewish people. Some of the stuff that is said here about the servant of the Lord. If you heard James read, you know it was introduced as it's talking about the servant of the Lord. This one, this name that we understand, sometimes this is talking about the Messiah who's to come. Isaiah 42 through 53, it talks about this servant of the Lord. But it is so contradictory. How this servant is going to serve is so contradictory to what was expected of the Messiah. It's confusing for some, and yet... For an Ethiopian eunuch that day, it brought him hope. And we're going to look at how Jesus wants to serve you from this passage. If you're uncomfortable with that language, how Jesus wants to serve you, I want you to know that Jesus himself said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. And we're going to look at what was confusing for some, and I believe what is going to bring hope to some people today. And not just those of you in the church. I hope for those of you in the church this morning that again, like every week, you come in here and you are challenged about who Jesus is, not just what you want him to be, but who the scripture says he is and what he does. Church, I got to tell you, I'm very, very concerned about something here. I'm, I'm, I'm adding all kind of stuff to this sermon. Get it together, Neil, here. But, um, y'all, I, I really am concerned that most of us believers, I'm talking about people in the church, when we read our Bible or we listen to a sermon on Sunday morning, we are listening to what we uh, want to agree with and what inspires us. But I'm telling you, that Bible was written for you to put it above your head and for you to be challenged by what God says and what, who he says he is. So I hope for you that this morning, but I hope more than anything for those of you who maybe you're still in the process of figuring out who Jesus is. I wanna tell you how he wants to serve you. How he is confusing for some, but brings hope to others, okay? And I've got four things for you. How Jesus wants to serve you. The first is this. In this scripture, we are told that the Messiah of the world, when he comes, he appears unattractive, okay? Point one, he appears unattractive. When this servant of the Lord is first introduced, it says in chapter 52, verse 14, just as many of you, Judah, were astonished, my people, um, just as many were astonished at you, so his appearance, this servant, was marred more than any man. Unattractive in this way. He was disfigured. Okay? That's what I mean when I say unattractive. In chapter 53, verse 2, it says he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. It, he appears insignificant. That's what I mean when I say unattractive. You know, it's the picture of parched ground and a little shoot comes up at a place where all the trees have been mowed down. And I want you to hear this. Maybe you've come to church and you've come on a Christmas Eve. I just talked to somebody last night. I said, I visited your church at Christmas Eve. And you hear this nice little romanticized story that we tell here about Jesus coming in a manger. I want you to know it's not just a nice little romanticized story. It's a story about a God who comes so insignificant, so disfigured, that, that it's, it's really hard for the people of that day who he came for to even get it, okay? Let me show you the next part of verse two. It says, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. I, when I say unattractive, disfigured, insignificant, and un, unimpressive. A king is supposed to go to a throne, not an animal's feeding trough. 
Verse three, it says, he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, unattractive in this way, disfigured, insignificant, unimpressive, and actually repulsive. He was despised. This is why it was confusing for some and hope for others. Why I use repulsive, we know that Jesus hung on a cross. And again, for those of you who might be in the process of understanding what Jesus is about, I want you to know he didn't come on a gold cross. It was really messy. That's why we actually have this thing we call a messy cross in our worship center to remind us that when Jesus hung on a cross, this is how repulsive it was at the time. The Roman philosopher Cicero would say, hey, we shouldn't even be using the word cross as Romans. And for sure, don't ever hang a Roman on a cross. It's too repulsive. And for Jews in their Old Testament, it says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. The thought of getting your mind wrapped around our Messiah comes on a cross was totally, totally confusing. In fact, when I use the word unattractive, what do we expect, y'all, for someone who's to come and help people? In our culture, it's all wrapped around the person who's most beautiful, right? In Isaiah, earlier when we're told about the Messiah in Isaiah 33, 17, it actually says this, your eyes are gonna behold the king in his beauty. Here's what I want you to understand today, that when <sighs> this confusing thing that he comes unattractive the hope is this, the servant of the Lord Jesus serves up his beauty so that you can have beauty. Sin is always a disfiguring of the beauty of God's original creation, the world around us and the people he has made in his image. And it's not hard for me to imagine an Ethiopian eunuch looking in the mirror. Not only looking at himself physically, but looking at his heart. And thinking things like, I'm ugly. If anybody really knew how I felt about myself or all that I've done, nobody could really love me. And I can imagine in a culture that puts so much focus on our bodies that this could be really great hope for some. You know, think about this, y'all, our culture, we put, spend so much time on one hand working on our physical bodies, spending so much time making them beautiful. And on the other hand, a culture where we spend so much time even destroying our physical bodies, maiming that which God has created. And wherever you're at on that, I want you to know, the scripture says there is one who did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He gave up his beauty so that you could know that you could have a beauty for eternity. That that's how Jesus can serve you today, wants to serve you. He appears unattractive. Let me tell you another thing, point two here. He carries grief. He carries grief. Let me read the text. It says in verse three that this servant of God was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and surely 
Our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. You know, when the Bible talks in other places about the Messiah coming, it talks about the joy of victory. I love Psalm 96 where it says when the king comes and he brings his justice and his righteousness and his victory, all the trees of the forest are going to be clapping their hands and there's going to be singing in all creation and we love this idea of the joy of victory and in our culture we know this we all want to be around winners right and and we all want to experience that kind of joy and and, you know and here's here's where you know it (sighs) y'all when you go to a party and and I want (sighs) somebody heard me talking about this sermon this week and they just said Neil please be careful on this point It, it could really hurt some people When you go to a party, everybody wants to have a good time, right? Again, it's part of why we live in this substance abuse culture. And you know what's really hard? It's hard sometimes, and when the person comes in, that they're feeling cut off because maybe they've lost a job and they're grieving. Maybe they've lost a family member and they're grieving and nobody knows what to do with them. And and everybody's kind of like moving in the other direction. I'm not saying that's how it should be, okay? Or, Or the person comes in and they're depressed or you're the person and it's maybe why you don't go to the party because you don't want to be that person. And it's not hard for me to imagine that there's an Ethiopian eunuch who's reading this text and he's getting hope because he reads about one who knows about grief. It's not hard for me to imagine that when nobody else was around, that Ethiopian eunuch was carrying a lot of grief about his own life. And I, as over the past year I've been meditating on this, I just wanted to share with you a couple thoughts on this idea of grief that just have been like gifts for me that God has given. One is this. I remember one day, y'all, I'm just meditating on this text. And it just hit me. I started thinking about when I was a young man and some things others did to me. And it just hit me, oh, Jesus you're not just dealing with the act of sin itself. Jesus, you're also carrying the grief of the repercussions of those sins and the things others did to me. And then it hit me, and Jesus, you weren't just serving me by taking care of the grief that other sins put upon me. I started thinking about some of the choices I made in my own sin, where I thought I was doing something cool. And how he was carrying that grief also. And not just the grief of how others affected me or how I affected myself, but also the pain I inflicted on others. And then he gave me one more thing, y'all, that I just wanna, Give because some of you today need this. Especially if you're the person who's not going to the party because you don't want to be that person. Your grief is not too much for him. He's carrying the grief of the whole world. Your grief is not too much for him. I hope that for some of you today, that which is confusing to others, wait, a Messiah who's bringing grief, I want the Messiah who's bringing victory and joy that that. He wants to serve you today. My third thing. Okay, we've got a, a Jesus who wants to serve you, who appears unattractive, who carries grief, and also in the text we learn he suffers violence. He suffers violence. It says, 
in the Old Testament that the Messiah is going to be one who comes and brings peace and justice. Isaiah 42, where this servant of the Lord is first introduced, it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him, and he's going to bring forth justice to all the nations. And suddenly, in chapter 53, this horrendous thing happens. It says, 53 verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. The one who's supposed to put an end to violence suffers violence. How does that happen? The one who is supposed to bring an end to all cruelty suffers excruciating cruelty. It's why I say for sure it was confusing for some and and brings hope to others. You know, the idea of being pierced through, y'all, here's how graphic the language is. It's the idea of taking a spear to the front of someone's body, driving it through all the way, and it comes out the back side. That's why I say he suffers violence. And that's why I say it's not hard for me to imagine. An Ethiopian eunuch who has had violence done to his physical body. We also know that a eunuch, although he may have had some kind of special privileges as CFO in the Queen's court, they were often looked down upon and harshly treated by others, okay? And I want you to know how Jesus wants to serve up hope today. To those of you when you're in the private space of your life, To those of you who have had violence done to you, he came for you. And I want to say something even harder here, (sighs) but it's actually hopeful. You know, we live in a culture now where it's interesting the things we come up with, the categories, sometimes in church that are unforgivable sins, sometimes outside of church that are unforgivable sins. I want you to hear this, even if you were a perpetrator of violence, he came for you. Now as to answer a question that some are you gonna have. It doesn't mean that there are not consequences for sin, church. And if if in a moment of rage and anger, I do a violent act like chop off my arm, I'm gonna deal with some consequences like that for the rest of my life, right? But I want you to know, Jesus wants to serve you even in that. He serves, he appears unattractive, he carries grief, he suffers violence, and he takes guilt, okay? The text tells us in Isaiah 53, verse six, all of us, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall right on him. And then when you go to verse 10, it says, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. The one who's not gonna have descendants will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Now, church, the Bible talks a lot about guilt offerings. It's not popular to talk about guilt in our culture, but, but again, we all know that when somebody is truly guilty against another person, at least restitution has to be made. Same way with God. In the Old Testament, it says the way you make restitution is through animal sacrifices, and you had to have a perfect animal. 
And now the Messiah, this one who they expected to be a person who is perfectly righteous before God is saying, he's the guilt offering. It's not going to be an animal. It's going to be a person. Oh, that would have been so confusing. And yet, in verse 11, it says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. The two words here, church, get this, righteous and justify, are basically the same words in Hebrew. Righteous means he was the perfect spotless lamb of God. That's what we call Jesus. And he becomes what we call a substitutionary sacrifice so that you could appear in the presence of a holy God. And I love how it, this is talked about in the New Testament about Jesus in Romans chapter five, verse six. It says, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. He takes your guilt, and it's not hard for me to imagine an Ethiopian eunuch who may have been regretful for what was done or what he did to his body or what he sacrificed for his job, for his ultimate fulfillment, how he got cut off. You know, can I say one more thing here I left out in the very beginning? You know, he did it for whatever cause, right? You know, right now what I see is a lot of people in our culture and people in church, because you're looking for something to give your life to, so we find some kind of cause. And what I see is a whole generation of people are fracturing because they're giving themselves to a cause. And they're getting cut off from their family, their friends, even their church. And I'm wondering, after a few years of this insanity, if some of you are actually now having some regrets but you can't say it out loud, okay? But I want you to know that he knows what it's like to be cut off for any reason at all. And there's hope for you today that absolutely, no matter what you have done, he can take your guilt. And you know the beautiful thing on this? He does so willingly. He does so willingly. You know, the verses that we started with here about the Ethiopian eunuch in Isaiah 53, verse 7, it says, let me read this one more time, Isaiah 53, 7, it says, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, he did not open his mouth. He did so willingly. That's why it said, Jesus came like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, does not open his mouth. And then in the next verse, it says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who even cared that he was cut off for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? He does so willingly. Y'all, I I'm gonna tell you, I heard this three times this week, and I kept trying to leave it out of this sermon. But I want you to know this. Whatever you have done, whatever it looks like when you look in the mirror, this whole thing tells us that God is not just tolerating you, he is delighting in you, and he did so willingly, carried grief, suffered violence, took on guilt, appeared unattractive. He did so willingly because he actually wants to delight in you today, and that's why I say Jesus wants to serve you. So what do you do with it? Well, you know, Isaiah 53, 1, it says this. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who's got to see it? And who's going to believe it? A lot of people aren't because it's going to be so confusing for some that he would do all this for us in this way. But for those of you who can see it, I want to tell you one more thing about the Ethiopian eunuch. I don't know how long he was with Philip. I don't know how, how much discussion they got into. But I got a feeling they talked about a lot, okay? Maybe they even talked about... Isaiah 56, where it says, y'all, get this. Go back and read Isaiah 56 today, because this ain't a part of the sermon. It's just a little more extra for you, first hour. In Isaiah 56, it says the eunuch is going to have descendants. <sighs> I'm telling you, this lit up his soul. And, and so, <laughs> they're riding along. And in Acts chapter 8, we read the eunuch 
saying, as they're going along the road, they come to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, let me tell you what the eunuch was saying there. The word baptized, it, the idea is you do this symbol to communicate something that has happened in your heart, okay? The Greek word is baptizo. It means to identify with. You know what I think after, after Philip's telling him about the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the Ethiopian eunuch is thinking this, this guy understands me. This person knows me. This person identifies with me. And I want to identify with him. I believe in him. And today, I want you to know, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not sure you've believed in Jesus, know that he has identified with us and he wants to serve you today. And that if you say, I wanna identify with him and I wanna believe in him, you can know that you're a part of, I like to say this, his forever family. And so here's what I'm gonna do here. I'm just gonna tell you some things that you could communicate to him right now quietly in your own heart. I'm gonna tell you them and then I'm gonna pray for them. So if you're interested in Jesus serving you today, you could say something like this. You could say, Jesus, I, I believe that you appeared unattractive because you wanna give me beauty. And Jesus, I believe that you, that you carried grief so that I could have joy, that, that you suffered violence so that I could have victory and that you took on my guilt by your perfect life on the earth, your death on a cross, and that your resurrection validates all that you claim to be the one who is from God, okay? So right now, I'm gonna ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if there's somebody here today, you, wanna, you want to know that this is for you, that you know that Jesus has taken care of all of your sin and all of your guilt and all of your shame and brings you to the Father. I'm gonna ask you just to pray with me now using words very similar to what I just told you, okay? Just quietly in your own heart. Jesus, thank you for appearing unattractive so that you could bring me into ultimate beauty for all eternity. And Jesus, thank you for carrying grief, the pain that my wrongdoings and sin and dysfunction ha has caused me, that others have brought on me. And Jesus, thank you for suffering violence so that I might have joy. And Jesus, thank you for taking the guilt that I have felt at times and didn't even realize it. And in an angst that it seemed like no matter what I did, I couldn't make myself feel right. Thank you, Jesus, for doing this by your life here on this earth, by your death on the cross and your resurrection that validated all of your claims. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I, I wanna say some, one, one more thing to you here and then we're all gonna worship together and take joy in what Jesus has done for us and how he has served us. If you prayed that prayer, whether you're online or in person, I wanna tell you something. The, this other thing about baptism is it was a public thing and we do it publicly here in our church. If you've never been baptized, I wanna encourage you to call the church and find out how you could be baptized. But, but I want you to know that this public idea is so that somebody else would know. And that if you've prayed that prayer today, I am begging you right now that, that you would go and tell someone. I believe God can put a Philip in your life that you would tell someone so that you will know what the next steps are so that you can enter more fully into all that Jesus has done for you, okay? So church, let's stand together. And, and we're gonna worship here as we think about the confusing sometimes <laughs> surprising substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus and my hope here is for us as believers right now that by seeing what Jesus has done for you you might experience joy